a little bit of cardiovascular, right? Go ahead and stand up for a minute because I want you to actually process what we're about to look at. I'm the only person who will remain intellectually coherent because I didn't eat. Your lasagna or whatever it was will interfere with what we're about to do. So go up on your toes a few times. A doctor friend of mine said that one pint of blood <laughs> squirts into your frontal lobe. No, he didn't tell me that. Every time you do it. Raise your hands, go like this. We'll film this and put it on the internet. Show people what's going on at the Franktown Seventh-day Adventist Church. <laughs> All right, have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> I should have tempted you to say something like hallelujah while your hands were up. That would have felt so unnatural for all of you, wouldn't it have? All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll jump right in. Father in heaven, uh, we're under the impression that you're better than we know. We, we sense that there are things about you that are that are dark to our understanding. There's, there's fog, there's blockage. We've been hurt, we've been wounded. There are things that have happened to us, Lord, that has obstructed our vision of you. We tend to interpret your character through our pain, through the tragedies that we've experienced and through the evils that we see in the world. Father, I pray that right now you would use this time to, to open our understanding to the spiritual dimension of reality. Help us to see that there is more to this world than meets the eye. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, within the biblical narrative, there's this really strange idea, strange to those who are not familiar with it and strange to those who are familiar with it. The Apostle Paul talks about this idea that, that God is the creator of all things, and then he uses this language, things that are seen and things that are unseen. This is in Colossians. God has made everything that there is and there is a seen realm and there's an unseen realm. So if we were to do a head count, for example, in this room right now and uh, report back to ourselves exactly how many people are here, we would be wrong in our assessment of the number of free agents in this room. For every person present here, we know by the biblical account of reality that there is at least one more. At least one more. Jesus specifically tells us in Matthew chapter 18 that every child, for example, is attended by a guardian angel. That's where we get the guardian angel ideas from Jesus. Jesus is the one who issued a warning. He said, he said, do not violate or harm little children. Do you not know that their angels do always behold the face of their father in heaven? In other words, angels are guarding children and looking to the father's face to intervene if necessary on the child's behalf. So Jesus is saying, don't mess with little kids. So, so if we did a head count, we would be wrong because every person here is attended at least by one guardian angel throughout life. Isn't it going to be an amazing thing when we get to the other side of this great controversy between good and evil and, and we meet, each of us meet our guardian angel face to face on a first name basis? I can tell by looking at some of you that your guardian angel has had numerous nervous breakdowns <laughs> just trying to keep up with your junk in this life, you're going to have to apologize to your guardian angel for some of the stuff that you've put that angel through. I, I'm going to have to apologize for what I put mine through. But, but, but there's this idea that we live in a reality, listen to the language, of overlapping realms. Seen and unseen. Now, not only are there holy angels that God himself assigns to individuals. But, but the biblical narrative tells us that, that this, this heavenly order of beings that, that are generally called angels, that approximately one-third of them defected 
rebelled, apostatized against the kingdom of God. And they took up residence, though unseen, took up residence on earth. Revelation chapter 12 says that the devil and his angels have come down to you having great wrath because they know that their time is short. So we live in a reality of overlapping realms. There is more to reality than meets the eye at any given moment. Now, I wasn't always aware of this. I was raised in an extremely secular home. God, Jesus, Muhammad for that matter, Buddha, no religious figure was anywhere on the radar of the home that I was raised in. There was no Bible in sight. God was a foreign concept. Of course, I had heard of the idea that there was some supreme being, some God. And I had heard the name of Jesus before, mainly in derogatory terms. So I knew there was this, this idea. I knew there were, for example, religious buildings called churches on street corners. I had never been in one. It seemed a little spooky to me. I thought, what do they do in there? But they, they were there, these buildings called churches, and people go there and they, they do something. I don't know what they do. So I was raised in a really, really secular home. My first encounter with the things of God, Jesus, angels, great controversy, cosmic war, came from a very unlikely source, at least for you. The way I was raised, it was a very natural source of information. It was one of my main sources of information. Do you know this face? Raise your hand if you know who this is. Anybody in the room? There is not a solitary, there is one person, two people in this room. This, yeah, well, this isn't Led Zeppelin. This is the lead singer of Led Zeppelin. This is, this is Robert Plant. And Robert Plant, I was obsessed with Led Zeppelin. <laughs> I was obsessed with the lyrics. God was nowhere on my radar, but this is what Led Zeppelin and Robert Plant, the lead vocalist, was singing to me. And I was pouring over the lyrics that were provided for me in the, in the album jacket. Queen of Light took her bow and then she turned to go. The Prince of Peace, have you heard of him? Embraced the gloom and walked the night alone. The sky is filled with good and bad that mortals never know. Side by side, we wait the might of the darkest of them all. Who might that be? Well, the dragon of darkness. And just so you know, Robert Plant sings to us, there's only one thing that obstructs him, and it's light. The light, the sunlight, blinds his eyes. Meet me, Jesus, Robert Plant cries out. Meet me, oh, meet me in the middle of the air. If my wings should fail me, Lord, oh, please meet me with another pair. Hear the angels marching? Marching? Can you hear the angels marching? It's a question that Robert Plant is asking us in the song. It's got to be my Jesus. Oh, it's got to be, it's got to be my Jesus. Oh, come, Jesus, and take me home. This was my encounter with religion, my first encounter with religion. My mom tricked me into Bible study. She had become a follower of Jesus, and she was getting my girlfriend into it, and I thought they were losing their minds, and I was completely resistant. I said, no way, I'm not interested in any of that. You guys, this is insane. What, do you have an imaginary friend now in the sky? What, that's how I felt about it. I thought it was just absolute nonsense. Oh, please just read the Bible. And I'm not reading the Bible. I wouldn't read Jane Austen, and I'm not reading the Bible. That's how I thought about it. I thought it was literature. I thought it was in the category of the Greek myths and Shakespeare. And then my mom tricked me. She said, Ty, the Bible is full of song lyrics. I said, really? A mother's love and manipulation. She knew I was obsessed with song lyrics. She said, there's song lyrics in the Bible. I was full of song. There's a whole book called Psalms. I said, you're kidding me. What are psalms? She said, songs. So I started reading the Bible. 
because my mom tricked me into reading the Bible to find song lyrics because I love poetry, always have. As far back as I can remember, poetry lights me up inside. Song lyrics light me up. And so when I began reading the Bible, it was really quite fascinating to read the Bible and encounter some familiar characters that I already was familiar with through the lyrics of Robert Plant in Led Zeppelin. Sure enough, I read in the Bible about a dragon and about angels and about Jesus. Now, I have no idea what Robert Plant was trying to make out of the whole thing. I do know that it's at least clear that at one point he cried out for Jesus to save him. And I don't know about you, but I'm a hopeful, optimistic kind of guy. I think heaven is going to be populated with more people than we estimate. We're going to be surprised at some of the people that are there. And I have a hunch some people are going to be surprised you're there. They're going to be like, whoa, you made it? Really? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that the entire great controversy between good and evil, between good and evil angels, between Jesus and the dragon of darkness, whose eyes are blinded by sunlight, according to Robert Plant. I'm going to suggest to you that the entire great controversy, the cosmic war between good and evil centers, hinges on this idea of love. Love is the currency of the kingdom of God. It's the emotional currency. It's the relational currency. It's the spiritual, moral currency of God's character and kingdom. And I'm going to suggest to you that there are inherent rules or what we might refer to as inherent logic to love. We already know this. In fact, almost everything I'm going to share with you, you already know at some level of your being because you operate on these principles on a daily basis in all your relationships. You just live like this. Whether you've identified it or not, this is how you operate. And I'm just going to wrap words around the way reality actually works and whether you had a Bible in your hand or believed it or not, you'd say, yeah, that's pretty much how life works. Why? Because love is possessed of inherent logic. Love, by popular definition, is just shallow sentimental feelings. No, no, no. Love is a very coherent, cogent, logical, principle-based reality. It's a strong thing, it's not a weak thing. Love, in fact, is the most powerful force in the universe and it emanates from the very thinking and feeling process of God himself. God literally created you and me by the energy of love. God is love and love cannot endure aloneness and so here we are. I'll create in my image, I'll create others who can love like we love. There's an inherent logic to love. So some of the inherent logic that is of interest to us, and it's a bigger concept than this, but I'm trying to make this as simple as possible, and I'm trying to, to tailor this for our purposes, for our subject. So, so for our purposes, the logic of love moves in this direction. Love necessitates freedom and freedom is a concept that entails authority to the individual free moral agent and jurisdiction over territories or domains. We all operate like this. If you came home some Monday afternoon and you walked into your house and you and I had never met, you don't know me from anybody. You walk into your house and you see me, an unfamiliar face, some dude sitting on your sofa eating a sandwich because I happen to love sandwiches. I have gone into the refrigerator, I have taken out all your sandwich material and I have made myself a sandwich. Hopefully you had avocado available. And there I am eating the sandwich on your sofa. You walk in the house, are you not enraged at the violation? Is there not a door? On this house? Does it not have a lock? Are there not walls? Have you not breached 
a line? Have you not violated my domain, you might be thinking? Well, you're not thinking it through in all that language, but you feel violated. Until your husband walks out from the back room and says, hey, baby, this is my friend Ty. I just met him this afternoon. He likes sandwiches, I like sandwiches, so I invited him over and we're gonna have sandwiches together. Hey, Ty, this is my wife. Hey, nice to meet you. Great sandwich material. Does anything change inside of you in that moment? Everything changes inside of you. You don't feel violated anymore unless you and your husband have a bad relationship and you don't want any of his friends to be invited over. You feel fine now because you intuitively operate on the assumption that this domicile is a shared domain over which you and your husband have joint jurisdiction and authority and the freedom, therefore, to invite others to come in to that domain. You operate on that assumption. Apart from your husband's invitation, I'm an invader. But with his invitation, I'm an invited guest. Everything's fine. This is true of your car. This is true of your cubicle at work. You're pretty possessive of that spot. I mean, who moved my pad and pen? Somebody has been here. I can tell. I can sense it. There's an aroma. Who was here? Right? This applies to everything in life. We all operate on this assumption that love makes us a certain kind of creatures. We have what we sometimes refer to as agency, don't we? We have, therefore, authority over plots of land and emotional plots of territory and intellectual plots of territory. We possess authority. That's what we are. That's how we operate. Now, this shows up everywhere, everywhere. Genesis to Revelation. You just read, now that, now that you've had it explained, now that I've wrapped language around the concept to you, I just challenge you, go back and read the Bible again. You will see things you've never seen. You'll be, oh my goodness, the whole Bible is built on this premise of love and freedom and authority and jurisdiction. I mean, it's all there. It's what the book's about. The whole reason Jesus came into the world was to take back an illegitimately claimed territory and give it back to those to whom it rightfully belongs as their domain. That's what the whole story's about. So it shows up over and over again. I'm going to give you one example that we're going to unpack a little bit here. Okay, so this is Jesus, and he's speaking to Peter. You remember him? Peter is here called Simon. That was another name for him. So the Lord, that's Jesus, said, Simon, Simon, Peter, Peter. Peter, listen up. I need to explain something to you. Indeed, Satan has asked for you. Asked for me? Who, who did he ask? Well, I, I hope whoever he asked likes me. <laughs> you can feel all of that in the text, can't you? He has asked for you. Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. That's an agricultural metaphor. We, we might use a different language today. Satan has asked for you to take you down for the count. He's going to diminish you. He's going to brutalize you. He's asked, for, he's asked, listen to the language now, listen. Satan in this text, according to Jesus, has asked for access to Peter. Access. Now, apparently, Satan is subject to a higher authority because apparently he has to, what? Ask. And the fact that he is asking means that whoever he's asking can say what? No or yes. Just hold on to this. But look at this. Then Jesus follows up and says, but I have prayed for you. Satan has asked for you, but I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, notice the definite positive nature of the grammar. Not, I hope you make it, dude. But when you have returned, you're going to defect. 
You're going to lose your marbles. You're going off course, Peter. You are pretty self-assured. You've got some, <clears throat> you've got some chinks in your armor. You've got some dark spots in your personality. There's something going on inside of you. You're going to derail, but you're coming back to me. Of a certainty, you'll be coming back. Why? Because I prayed for you. My prayers, Peter, are apparently very powerful. Because when you have returned to me, I have an assignment for you. Strengthen your brethren. So in this passage, we have a convergence of four wills. Did you, did you catch them? Okay, first of all, we have the Lord Jesus who's praying. We have Peter, the object or the subject of the text, of the prayers. And we have Satan who's asking for Peter, and we have the one being asked by implication, the Father, God, is being appealed to. The Father is being asked by Satan, and the Father is being prayed to by Jesus. There's a conflict. There's a controversy. A decision has to be made. There are natural rules that govern the domains of free moral agents. Peter's a free moral agent. He's allowing, to some degree, some degree of access to his thinking, his feeling, and his relational process. And because he's allowed access to some degree, he's weakened to some degree. There's something going on. Jesus wants Peter's life to go one direction. The devil wants his life to go another direction. And prayer is being leveraged on Peter's behalf. But there's more to the picture. There are four converging wills. Listen, there are four converging wills. And Peter's will is one of them. Peter's will is one of them. Peter has agency. He has some kind of leverage in the convergence of the four wills. There are natural rules that govern the domains of free moral agents. And here are those rules, okay? All of this is simply a summary of the biblical narrative from the standpoint of the great controversy. The rules of engagement for human beings, planet Earth, the cosmic conflict between good and evil are simply these. Number one, because God is love, this is, by the way, the entire premise of Scripture. <laughs> the only thing that distinguishes Christianity from every other philosophy and religion in the world is this foundational core concept that God is love. Everybody else is thinking in terms of power. The gospel alone is thinking in terms of love. So because God is love, he will not employ force or deception, but rather he operates within the parameters of truth and love. So there's a sense in which God, because of who he is, will not cross certain lines. Are you, are you tracking with me here? There are certain things God simply won't do. Because as, as the scripture says in the New Testament, he is true to himself. Which is another way of saying he will be consistent and coherent within the parameters of his own identity. He's not going to break ranks with his character. He's just going to be who he is, who he is, who he is, who he is, who he is. So he will never employ force or deception. He only will employ truth and love. Or we could say it this way. God is going to save you eternally by the sheer power of his love or not at all. Nothing else will be brought to bear upon you. Second rule of engagement in the great controversy is that Satan employs deception and force. God won't, Satan does employ deception and force, but, listen, listen, 
He has no access to any human domain beyond what is granted to him. And there are how many converging wills in the passage we read? Four. God's will is a factor. The will of the prayer, in this case Jesus, is a factor. The will of Satan is a factor, and the will of the subject in any given encounter is a factor. So, so Satan, I mean, this is so fabulous to realize. If you realize, this is amazing if you realize this. You're going to suddenly feel extremely powerful in this moment. Satan cannot, cannot enter in, have access to your life without the tie-breaking variable of your will. You cannot, it's not just a matter of, man, I sure hope I make it because the devil's pretty powerful. It's, no, you will be victorious and you will be eternally a conqueror in Christ if you simply say yes. The devil himself and all his imps cannot take you down. What you need to understand, quoting an author, is the true force of the will. And it's pretty powerful. <laughs> you can just simply say, no! And it doesn't matter if Satan is asking for access to you. The father can say, he said, no! Back off! And besides that, Jesus is praying for him. So no, the answer is no. Go to hell, Satan, the father might say. No! Your will, my will, is a variable in the process that is of extreme importance to realize. You have the power to bar access to the devil and demons to have anything to do with your life. But we're going to take this a step further. Watch this. In each encounter, the deciding vote lies with the individual free moral agent. Okay, that's you, but this is amazing. Because you and I are connected, because you're my wife, because you're my son, because you're my daughter, because you're my cousin, because you're my auntie, because you're my uncle, because you're my neighbor, because you are a fellow human being, and I occupy this shared territory called planet Earth with you, and Jesus is my Lord and Savior, I have the privilege of actually giving God access to your life when you're not asking for it. You can have a rebellious, idiotic, immature teenager, and everybody does at some point, and they could want nothing to do with Jesus. And you can say, Father, she's an idiot. She's not praying. She wants nothing to do with you. But I'm her dad. And I give you permission to pursue her heart, to soften her, to woo her, to draw her to you. I give you permission. You have my free permission, access to, to my home, including her bedroom including his bedroom, enter into the chambers of her thoughts and his mind and help him to sense his need for you. Satan's access to human beings, rule number four, is limited by two primary factors, our permission and God's permission. And here's the amazing thing. God is always looking to what's going on in your and my thinking and feeling process to determine whether he's going to give permission. He's always, always, God is always ruling in your favor. <laughs> to the degree that you're saying yes to him, he's saying hyper yes to you. You open a door, he doesn't mosey through it. He runs through it. God wants you. He loves you. He's pursuing you. All you have to do is invite <laughs> and say yes and invite him in. Number five, the victory Christ gained at Calvary transferred all authority in, into his hands. You know this if you are biblically 
uh, literate at all. If you read the Bible at all, if you've been through Bible studies with anybody, you remember that passage called the Gospel Commission, right? Where Jesus in Matthew 28 says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Just pause right there. That is a direct reference to the victory he gained at Calvary. Calvary was the definitive act of revelation of the principles of truth and love. And Jesus proved that love is superior to hate, that love is superior to anger, that love is superior to vengeance, that love is superior to violence, that love is superior to retaliation, that forgiveness trumps all wrongdoing. To use the words of James, that justice is triumphed over by mercy. The idea is that Jesus is telling us, hey, hey, because of the victory that I gained by loving all of you without ever yielding to self-interest, proved and demonstrated that love is the superior principle in operation in the universe. So all of the collective judgment of the heavenly hosts has ruled that I am now the rightful authority over planet Earth. And I'm a human being by virtue of my incarnation, so I'm, I'm here to tell you that a human being is now the new Lord. Satan has been displaced and I've taken over. Not with violence, not with coercion, not with ma ma manipulation, but with truth and love. The devil's kingdom is going down. It's just a matter of spreading the good news so that as many people as possible can say yes to the new regime. But in principle, in historical fact, Jesus possesses all authority in heaven and earth. It all belongs to him now. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go you therefore in the light of the authority that I now possess. I'm delegating that authority to you. Go, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing. That's the, that's the initiation ceremony into the new system, into the new regime. Baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is remarkable, you guys. If we begin to wrap our minds around this, you won't find it difficult to pray. You'll be motivated to pray. Because as long as you think prayer has to do with trying to get God to do things that he doesn't want to do. Well, first of all, in belief system, you're a pagan. You're not a Christian yet. That's paganism. That's not Christianity. You can't make God any better than he already is. You can't persuade him to do anything. He already wants to do everything that is good and wonderful and beautiful and true. He's on the edge of his throne, so to speak, just waiting for you or me to say, come on in have access. Do what you do. And when you begin to realize that, you're motivated to pray rather than doing it as a drudgery or as a religious ceremony of some kind in order to, you know, do what you're supposed to do. I mean, you're supposed to pray, so I guess you should. No, you're not supposed to pray, therefore, I guess I will. No, no, no. It's a very interpersonal thing. God is waiting. Extend the invitation. You don't even need flowery words. You can say, say really short, effective prayers like, help! That's a prayer, man. That's a prayer. And God's like, oh, come on, give me a few more words. I want some formality here. You weren't even on your knees when you said that. No, none of that's going on. Lord Jesus my neighbor is sinking. They're about to divorce. Please do something. Amen. That's a prayer. You don't have to get all deep about it. Well, that's deep. You can pray. The victory Christ gained at Calvary transferred all authority into his hands and he delegates it to us. So believers exercise their authority by two primary means. By faith slash what I'm calling agreement. Faith is essentially agreement with God. Faith and prayer. These are the two 
very powerful means at our disposal as believers. All authority has been given to him, and now we tap that authority, we access that authority, and he eagerly wants us to have it by means of agreement and prayer. God, I agree with your assessment of this situation. And I pray that you will do everything you can possibly do short of violating the free wills involved to bring about revelation, restoration, revitalization, whatever is needed in the situation. So your body, your mind, your home is, as I mentioned only in passing last night, your, 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 your body, your mind, your home is a domain. It's a territory. It's a realm. It's a, it's a jurisdiction over which you have authority to grant or bar access. You can say yes or no. You're very powerful. You can say yes or no. To God, you can say yes or no. To Satan, you can say yes or no. So here's how it works in, in the simplest terms that I've been able to come up with. There is what we might describe, and this is all biblical as you'll see, there is what we might describe as the wall principle for the note takers, the wall principle. What is it, the wall principle? Well, the Bible talks about this just all over the place. So in Job, for example, so Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? Okay, so, so, so if you're the devil, you see some kind of hedge, and it's not made of shrubbery. We're about to dis d discover what it's made of. If you're the devil, you, you can, God is saying, okay, I'm giving you permission to have access to Job on a limited time basis and with limited jurisdiction. And the devil responds by saying, well, I can't get to him. There's a, there's a, there's a hedge all around him. I can't get to him. I've been trying to get to him, but I can't because not only is Job surrounded by a hedge, but his household. If you know the story, Job's kids are not good kids. They're a bunch of party animals. And Job is praying for them morning and night. That's a part of the story if you read the book of Job. He's praying for his party animal kids. And even his household is protected. Even his kids are protected by his prayers and by his moral rectitude, which we'll come to in a moment. So what is this? Well, in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 5, For I, says the Lord, this is God talking, will be a wall of fire around her. Her here is Jerusalem. And I will be the glory in her midst. So, so God says, I myself, I will be a wall around Jerusalem. I'm going to exert, I'm going to exert my authority to create a wall of protection around Jerusalem. What about Psalm 34, verse 7? The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear God and the angels deliver them. So, so holy angels also compose the wall, the hedge around Jerusalem. God says, I will be a wall of protection around you and, and, and I've appointed angels that are going to stand around your premises, your mind, your body, your home and protect you. Elijah prayed, this is 2 Kings chapter 6, Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. This was a, a doubting Thomas of a young man who was saying, man, we're in trouble. Did you not see these armies, these, these, these armies that are coming? We're, we're sunk. And Elijah's like, chill, kid. I see what you don't see. Lord, would you please show him what's going on, really? Open his eyes, God. And this is what follows. Then the Lord opened the young man's eyes, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. You know what that young man is thinking at that point. I'm with Elisha. <laughs> right? These armies are coming, but I'm with him. 
I'm staying right by his side because there is an army of angelic protection around him. I have personally experienced this in life where I knew that a certain man was so godly and so in tune with the Lord, I knew that his walk with the Lord was so close that I said to myself as a young man, I'm just going to stick with him. I'm going to learn how to ride my spiritual bike with him. I'm, this, I'm his shadow. I'm going wherever that guy goes. I'm going to do what he does. I'm going to pray like he prays. I'm going to do what he does because I knew this guy was in tune with the Lord. And this is the thing that Paul talks about where he says, be ye followers of me as I am. I'm also a follower of Christ. So, so there is a legit mimicking of spiritual leaders in the body of Christ. If you're a new believer and you find somebody and you say, man, that guy, that woman, she is on fire for the Lord. She loves Jesus. She's kind. She's generous. She's respectful. That is a good, godly Christian woman. Just mimic her for the first year of your faith. Just learn the ways of spirituality by following that woman and her example. Ask her to pray for you. So then, in addition to the wall principle, there is the logical corollary, and that is the access principle. So the access principle goes something like this. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 12, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, because, note the word because, because, do you see what I, yeah, you have the slides. Because you despise this word. Okay? Israel, I've sent prophets to you, and they've told you the truth, and you've despised their word. And you have trusted in oppression and perversity. The context here is that Israel was following the example of the ungodly Gentile nations, by having oppressive economic and financial policies to take advantage of those who were not of their tribe. In other words, they were price gouging those who were not Jews. And God says, because you have despised the word of my prophets and you have trusted in oppression and perversity and you have relied upon them, up, upon oppression and perversity, you're relying on these principles that are contrary to my character and my kingdom. I have nothing to do with oppression. But, but if you're buying in to that system, if you're a part of the system of oppression, watch this, therefore, this iniquity shall be to you like a breach ready to fall. What's a breach? What's a synonym for breach? Like a hole, a break in the wall of protection, ready to fall. A bulge in a high wall, whose breaking comes suddenly in an instance. This scripture is, a, is literally telling us that, that God is trying to speak to me, to us, and if we are resistant to what he's trying to say to us, he takes that into account. He has to take it into account. Why? What's one of the, what's one of the rules of engagement? God will not, will not employ force or deception to save you or me. And because he won't employ force, if, if you and I, if we're saying no to his principles and we are buying into principles of oppression and perversity, what's happening? God of necessity is saying, you know what, I really love you, but your choices necessitate me backing up because you're voting for a different kingdom by your actions your actions are causing me to be barred from having access to your life and this is a common scenario where people will make a series of really really bad moral choices and then the whole house of cards comes down and then God is blamed well, God, what, how could, why didn't you, how could you, how could, you, God, you, 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 you. To which if you could hear God whispering back, he might say something like, well, actually, I, I wanted to have full access and to give you the protection that you now seem to think you want. But you pushed me out of your life. So yeah, 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 yeah. Pain is always the flip side of love. 
always. It's literally impossible to sin and sin and sin and sin and sin and not ultimately, eventually experience the effects. In broken relationships, people will start running from you. You'll wonder why you're isolated and friendless. Well, it's because you're a lying, conniving, oppressive, perverse human being. And people are backing up from you because they feel the weight of your sin. And God is backing up in order to honor your free will. And the wall comes tumbling down. And when the wall comes tumbling down, the wall of angelic divine protection, who's waiting to rush in through the holes in the wall? Satan and all of his angels. Ezekiel chapter 22 is a remarkable passage. I think this is the last passage we're going to look at, so hold on. We're almost done. Cheer up. We're, we're going we're gonna to we're gonna finish this. But this passage, you don't want to miss this. This is God speaking to a people group, to Israel. You are a land not cleansed. What do you mean, Lord? Well, it's princes, the princes of this land within are like roaring, like a roaring lion tearing at the prey. This is, this is capitalism without a conscience is what is being described here. This is people taking advantage of people for personal gain. They have devoured human lives. They have taken treasure and precious things. This is money and material goods. They have made many widows within this land by their oppressive policies. And I sought for anyone, this is God speaking, I sought for anyone among them who would repair the wall and stand in the breach, the hole in the wall, before me on behalf of the land, an intercessory role, so that I would not be obligated to back up and allow the enemy to have access and destroy this land. God doesn't want the land destroyed, but it's going to be destroyed. And this is one of the saddest lines in scripture. God says, I sought for anyone who would stand in the breach, but I found no one. I couldn't find a solitary human being who would stand in intercessory prayer on behalf of Israel. And so the wall came tumbling down and Israel, you know the story if you've read it at all, Israel went into captivity. The Assyrians on one occasion, the Babylonians on another occasion moved in and took the people captive. Why? Because the protecting Influence and wall of God was barred, taken down. The wall had fallen. You are a free moral agent, so you have specific authority that you are free to exercise or not. So what I'm sharing with you here is that within the biblical framework, as a loyal subject of the kingdom of Christ, you possess delegated authority to get things done on earth. You're extremely powerful. You can, you can open doors to, to holy angels into your home, your life, your neighborhood. You can open access to God and the Holy Spirit. And prayer is an act of war on the battlefield of the great controversy between good and evil. Peter, 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 listen, listen. Satan has asked for you to sift you, as we, to take you down. But Jesus says, but I have prayed for you. So all will be well in the end. You're going to struggle, you're going to defect, but you're coming back. And when you do, strengthen my brethren, your brethren. The great controversy between good and evil all hinges on this. God does all the good he can. To the maximum degree he can, 
in every situation he can while preserving our freedom. That's how powerful a human being is. You literally have the power to say no to the omnipotent God of the universe, and he will honor your choice. Well, the positive side, the good news is, is you have the power to say yes to the God of the universe, and he will honor your choice. So I want to do something with you right now um, as a little exercise as we close. And all we're going to do is this. We're going to have a prayer together, and I'm going to be the prayer And if you agree with this prayer, just silently in your mind or out loud, if you're comfortable, just say amen. That just means I agree with that prayer. I take that as my own prayer. Lord, ditto. Amen is like saying, ditto, Lord. Yeah, what he said. I agree with that. It's just agreement. That's all it is. Amen. So you say amen if you agree with this prayer. And what you're going to do, I'm going to pray for somebody, in particular, a person that needs the Lord right now. Her name is Arlana. Um, She's one of my former students. She worked for me for six months as an intern. She's 23 years old. She's extremely talented and intelligent. She was a standout student. She was a student uh, with me and uh, my colleagues in a program that we run, a discipleship program. She was a student with us for 15 weeks. And then she worked for me for six months. She's 23 years old, and she, through the stresses of The abuse culture of her family um, fell back into drug addiction. And I just wrote a letter for her the other day to the judge explaining my view of her character and asking that a compassionate court would not imprison her but put her in a situation where she would have the appropriate parameters so that she could have time and distance from the addiction enough to think clearly. Um, Her name is Arlana. I'm going to pray for Arlana. I love Arlana. She is my friend, my former student, and she's not thinking clearly right now. The most she could do to think clearly was to drop me a text and say, Ty, I'm in trouble. Would you be willing to write a letter on my behalf? And then comma, because she's such a gentle, precious soul, but but please do not write this letter for me if, if you can't. I don't want you to do it if you can't. She's so humiliated. She had just enough energy to send a text. So I'm going to pray for Arlana. Okay, and then I'm going to ask you to bring up in your mind someone. I don't know who it is. You don't have to say who it is. It's your husband. It's your wife. It's your, it's your child. It's your auntie, your uncle. I don't know who it is. It's your neighbor that you hear yelling at his wife when you're trying to go to sleep. I don't know who it is. But you bring somebody up in your mind, their name, their face, as the person that you are interceding for right now, and we're going to leverage our authority in the great controversy through prayer. Father in heaven, God, I want to bring Arlana before you. She's in trouble. She's not thinking clearly. She barely knows what to do next. Her life is imploding upon her because of the choices that she has made. God, she's hurting. She's confused. And Lord, she's vulnerable. The devil wants access to her her mind, her heart, her life. And he would like to take her down, Lord. She's your daughter. You love her. She is not making the right choices to give you access, but I'm her brother. And I'm a fellow human being. And Lord, I take hold of the victory of Jesus on her behalf. And I give you access to Arlana's mind, her emotions, her body, her life. Lord, please, please give a compassionate spirit to the judge. Help him to discern that Arlana needs some kind of help that is beyond incarceration. And uh, give him that wisdom, Lord. And, And as Arlana gets into this free zone that we're creating for her right now with no demonic access to her. Lord, build a wall of angelic protection around her so that she can think clearly and for herself begin choosing you again as she has in the past.
Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for Jesus. And it is in his name that I pray for Arlana and that we pray for every person that we have brought up in our minds that needs you right now. In Jesus' name, amen.